And just so you guys know, for CLB purposes, we're going to try to go until 1 o'clock with the questions. Oh. We've been asked to make sure, make sure. don't quit early. So uh, I, 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 the I, prospects I, I, of ending early are extremely low. Good. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> that'll make Nancy happy. Yeah, I was planning for a three hour. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. So, no, just so you know, if you feel like I need to shut it down, if people are leaving because they have some place to go at one o'clock, we'll just let them filter out, right? Yes, yeah, student, but the classes don't start at 1 15. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay, we'll get started. Good afternoon, and thank you to those joining us here in the room and via webcast for this semester's Elena and Miles Zaremski Law Medicine Lecture here at Case Western Reserve University School of Law in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, today's lecture is entitled, Will the Supreme Court Up in the Affordable Care Act? Uh, in the interest of time, allow me to introduce our panelists. Jonathan Adler is the Johann Verhey Memorial Professor of Law and the Director of the Center of Business Law and Regulation here at the Law School, where he teaches courses in administrative, constitutional, and environmental law. Relevant to our discussion today, Professor Adler is credited with conducting the critical analysis of the Affordable Care Act that has prompted four federal challenges to that act including the case and pending decision that brings us all here today, King versus Burrell. Next, we have Joseph White, the chair of the political science department here at Case Western Reserve University School and um, University and uh, the Luxembourg Family Professor of Public Policy. <laughs> Professor White teaches courses that include the U.S. political system, healthcare politics and policy in the U.S., and interest groups in the policy process, among others. His research interests include healthcare finance in the United States, uh, healthcare <coughs> cost control, as well as Social Security and Medicare. Professor White has an article soon to be published entitled Call After the ACA. Oh, that's old. And we also have with us here uh, today Miles Zaremski an esteemed graduate of Cases Law School and one half of the distinguished couple for whom this lecture is held in honor of. With over four decades of legal experience in health law, Mr. Zaremski has represented his clients in various stages of litigation, including before the United States Supreme Court. He has written numerous articles, chapters, and two books related to health care law. <laughs> Most recently, he has written three articles related to the ACA challenge before the U.S. Supreme Court. Those articles are included in your materials for today's lecture um, <clears throat> and were published by MedPage today. Uh, we are also honored to have with us MedPage's editor-in-chief, Peggy Peck, present with us also. <clears throat> Welcome, gentlemen. As we've discussed, you will each have 15 minutes uh, to present today and then we'll open the floor for questions from the audience for the remaining 15 minutes. Should folks have some place to be and need to filter out um, a little bit before 1 o'clock, I invite you to do so, but we will continue the program until 1 p.m., okay? And first we have <coughs> Professor Adler. Thank you. Um, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk about uh, this case, um, which we will get a decision on sometime between now and the end of June, most likely the last week of June. So uh, since I'm going first, let me say a little bit about the background of this case, um, the legal theory behind it, uh, and why the court, if it applies to the traditional approaches to statutory interpretation, that it applies as a general matter of course in the cases it hears will decide this case in favor of the plaintiffs. And I'm going to say at the outset, it is, it is my view and it has been my view for a few years now uh, that if this case did not concern the Affordable Care Act, uh, if it was not a case that could have significant implications for the implementation of that act, at least in the approximately three dozen states that are affected, uh, it would be a straightforward case, it would be an uncontroversial case, it would be a 9-0 case. Uh, 
Um, because it involves the Affordable Care Act, uh, it won't be 9-0. Uh, and uh, it will certainly be uh, a case that we're that is controversial and that we're paying attention to in terms of uh, what the issues are one of the things the Affordable Care Act does is it provides for the creation of exchanges uh, marketplaces in which consumers can comparison shop to purchase health insurance also means of imposing uh, regulatory restraints on insurance providers uh, and was also seen as a means through which tax credits and other subsidies for the purchase of qualifying health insurance could be provided when the law was being developed and debated, there was extensive debate over whether or not exchanges should be state-based, given that health insurance is traditionally uh, regulated at the state level, or whether or not they should be uh, federally based. Uh, and the Senate bill was based on a, which was the bill that was enacted into law, was based on a state model, a model whereby states would create exchanges. The House bill, which was not enacted, uh, and, and the bill that was preferred by the White House, uh, was premised on a single federal exchange. The law we got uh, provides for the creation of exchanges in two ways. First, in Section 1311, it provides a directive to states that states shall establish exchanges. Uh, it instructs them to do so, but as we know, Government cannot commandeer states, cannot require states to implement a federal regulatory program. So uh, this is not a, truly a command to states. It is an inducement. It is an incentive. It is, it is an indication of Congress's preference for state creation, uh, but a creation that Congress cannot mandate. Section 1321 of the Act then provides that if a state both either fails to create an exchange or fails to take other regulatory measures that the Department of Health and Human Services shall establish and operate such exchange. So according to Section 1321, uh, HHS is establishing the exchange that the state failed to exchange. And the reason uh, this matters uh, and the reason we have a case is because Section 1401 of the statute which creates Section 36B of the Internal Revenue Code, provides for tax credits and subsidies for the purchase of qualifying uh, health insurance plans in exchanges established by the state in, under Section 1311. The language that Congress decided to use in authorizing the tax credits uh, is very explicit both about who established the exchange and what type of exchange it is. The question before the court in King versus Burwell is given that approximately, um, well, I'll come back to my map in a second. Um, question of King versus Burwell is given that a bunch of states have not created their own state exchanges, whether or not exchanges established by the federal government may nonetheless be the locus of tax credits for the purchase of health insurance. And the argument that is made is that, well, they are exchanges. They are such exchanges. The problem is that if we want to know if tax credits are available, what do we do? We look at the provisions of the law that authorize tax credits, that provide for the IRS to be able to recognize them. The IRS can't just on its own recognize tax credits. It can only recognize and provide them where Congress is authorized. And so where do we look? We look where tax credits generally are provided for in the Internal Revenue Code, in the portions of the law that amend the Internal Revenue Code. And what we find is that Congress, in that portion of the Act, uh, in multiple provisions added to the law at multiple times during the drafting process specified that the tax credits would be available in exchanges established by the state under Section 1311. It requires the tax credits be purchased in exchange. How do we know? Because that's what Section 1401 says. Uh, it requires that individuals getting tax credits have either uh, income that's between 100 and 400 percent of the poverty line. How do we know? Because that's what it says in Section 1401. It also requires that tax credits are, are in exchanges established by the state under Section 1311. Again, how do we know? Because the same provisions that authorize the tax credits, that say they must be in exchanges, that say individuals must be within the relevant income range, and that provide other limitations on them, tell us quite explicitly that. And again, those provisions were added at, sep at separate times in the drafting process. This wasn't one typo or mistake made at one time. The phrase established by the state was added in multiple places at multiple times in these provisions. Uh, and for good measure, the word state is defined expressly in the statute to mean one of the 50 states or the District of Columbia. Unlike some of the other health care reform proposals that, that uh, were, had circulated, uh, there is no provision declaring federal equivalence. There is no provision expressly saying that tax credits would be available in federal exchanges. There is a provision to the contrary saying that states uh, mean, the word state means one of the 50 states of the District of Columbia. There are also provisions creating equivalence between U.S. territories and states for certain provisions. Again, no such provision creating equivalence for the federal government. Why does this matter? Well, because, as this map shows, about three dozen states failed to create their own exchanges. 
the exchanges that operate in those states are those established not by the state, but established by the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, and in 2011, as the, uh, as the administration began implementing the statute, they realized that states, uh, contrary to expectations, were not creating exchanges on their own, were not cooperating. And this presented the IRS with a problem. So what did they decide to do? Well, they decided to issue a regulation saying that despite the language of the statute, tax credits would be available in exchanges established under Section 11 or Section 1321 of the Act without any regard for whether they were established by the state or established by the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, objections were raised to this proposal during the notice and comment rulemaking. The IRS went ahead with the rule that created equivalence for tax credit purposes between state exchanges under Section 1311 and federal exchanges under 1321. Uh, this paragraph, which I won't bother reading to you, is the entirety of the explanation the IRS offered in the Federal Register when finalizing its rule. Those students of mine in the legislation regulation class recognize that this is not exactly the sort of thing that would satisfy the requirements of a, of a, a concise statement of general purpose. For APA purposes, uh, the IRS cites no statutory authority. It makes some vague reference to relevant legislative history, but cites nothing. It just simply said that basically this serves the purposes of the act, so this is what we are going to do. Um, eventually, after the rule was finalized, uh, some folks began to come up with arguments for why the IRS might be able to do this. Arguments, again, that the IRS did not make in the rulemaking. The most prominent of these explanations is the argument that Section 1321 read so as to allow the federal government to operate in the place of the state. And the reason for this is because when the Depart Secretary of Health and Human Services is instructed to, if a state fails to create its own exchange, to create such exchange. And the argument that what is such exchange? Well, such exchange is the aforementioned exchange. Which exchange is that? It's the exchange that the state would have established under Section 1311. It's a clever argument. If the statute merely said that tax credits are available in exchanges established under Section 1311, this argument probably would work. The problem is, is the language of the statute requires not only that it be an exchange, but that it be both an exchange established under Section 1311, that is, that meets 1311's regulatory requirements. It must be that type of exchange. But it's also contingent upon who created the exchange, because it references the state establishing the exchange, and elsewhere the statute references the Department of Health and Human Services establishing the exchange. So the word such doesn't get the federal government where it needs to be. And in fact, to this day, the federal government has yet to come up with a plausible explanation of where the phrase established by the state comes from and what purpose it serves, let alone why it was added at multiple times in multiple places in the statute, if in fact such exchange cre creates full equivalence. And an oral argument, the Solicitor sort of General, uh, when, when pressed on this point, just made com claims about uh, where the language came from that just are not uh, consistent with what we know about the drafting history uh, of the statute. Again, we have these phrases. They reference both who establishes the exchange and the type of exchange uh, that is established. On top of that, we see the phrase established by the state in other parts of the statute, and we see it in places where, uh, referring to exchanges, and we see it in places where the exchange in question can only be one established by the state. It can't be one established by the federal government. So just to give a couple of examples, under Section 1311 F3A, uh, the states are authorized to, um, or states are, are allowed to authorize exchanges established by the state to enter into agreements, basically to subcontract uh, contract out some of their responsibilities. That makes sense if we're talking about an exchange that the state establishes. It makes no sense whatsoever if we're talking about an exchange established and operated by the federal government. It makes no sense to talk about the, the, the states being in the position of telling the federal government what it is or is not allowed to do. Similarly, Section 2201, uh, in fact, says that states are required to establish procedures ensuring that an exchange established by the state utilizes a secure electronic interface sufficient to allow for determination of individual eligibility. This is a obligation placed on states for how exchanges established by the state are supposed to operate. What's particularly interesting about this provision is that it explicitly says that if a state fails to fulfill this obligation, it can lose all Medicaid money. So under the government's theory, this means if a state cannot ensure that an exchange established and operated by the federal government is complying with these requirements, the state can lose all of its Medicaid money. Not only would that be unconstitutional, uh, it, it, it 
renders the phrase established by the state meaningless. It further creates something that Congress could not do uh, and clearly did not do. What's interesting in the whole discussion about uh, what the statute does and does not do is on the one hand, we have the plain, clear text of the statute. We have long-standing rules of statutory interpretation that, among other things, say we do not ignore language in the statute. We try and give meaning to every phrase in the statute. We do not lightly generate surplusage. What we don't have, not only is we don't have contrary legislative text, we also don't have anything contradicting the plain text of the statute in the legislative history. This is the dog that didn't bark and no dog was harmed in the making of the slide. Uh, but what we don't have is a single statement by any a single contemporaneous statement by any supporter of the Senate bill, the bill that became law, saying the bill would provide for tax credits in federal exchanges. Not one. My co-author and I went through every reference to the word exchange in the congressional record. No one ever said that this bill would do it. People said other bills would do it. The Senate help bill expressly provided for tax credits in federal exchanges. It also conditioned the uh, tax credits on state cooperation in certain circumstances. But uh, this bill not only does it not have those provisions, uh, that no one said that this bill did. Now, what things that people did say, they said, well, there will be tax credits in every state. But they also said repeatedly, and here's just a quote from the president, just as one example, saying that every state will create their own exchange. The assumption until well after the bill was enacted was that states would cooperate. They might be slow, they might drag their heels, but they would eventually uh, cooperate. Uh, as the president said, by 2014, each state will set up what we're calling a health insurance exchange. Uh, the Senate Democratic Policy Committee said this in its talking points about the bill. Other folks said this about the bill. What they never said was tax credits will be available in a federal exchange. Not a single contemporaneous statement to that effect. The CBO scored the bill as if tax credits would be available in every state. The CBO also scored other bills as if tax credits would be available in a state. Other bills that there is no dispute placed conditions on the receipt of tax credits, conditions uh, of state cooperation. So the Senate Help Bill said states would not have uh, subsidies if they did not adopt the employer mandate. The CBO scored that bill the same way it scored the bill that passed, as if every state had credits because it scored it as if every state uh, cooperated. The CBO also admitted it never conducted its own legal analysis of the text that passed. It simply uh, adopted common assumptions. Uh, since I'm very short on time, let me just say a little bit about why Congress might have done this, why Congress might have written the bill this way. A um, few things. Uh, one, Congress did it before. That is to say, Congress has previously provided preferential tax treatment for the purchase of insurance that, uh, it uh, that is conditioned upon states enacting uh, qualifying regulations. There are other provisions in the, in the tax code that have the same origins as in the same under the same leadership that say if you get a certain type of insurance plan that is authorized under your state's laws, you get tax benefits. So Congress has done that before. In fact, those provisions in the tax code uh, look a lot like uh, uh, those in Section 36B and are, were identified by the Senate Finance Committee as the precursors for the provisions at issue here. Uh, experts proposed doing it. When the Senate decided it was going to do state exchanges, prominent health care reform supporters said, well, you can't force states to do it, so there, you might have to provide incentives. You can give them money, condition on their cooperation, you can say the tax credits are only available uh, if, in fact, states cooperate. Uh, and one of the folks that, that suggested that, uh, not only did he say there was no, once this issue was raised, did he forget he had said that and said there was no reason Congress would have done that. Uh, he was a significantly prominent supporter of health care reform that he was, he was invited to the White House for the signing of the bill. This was not a fringe idea. It was something that was being talked about. Uh, other bills, like the Senate Help Bill that I already mentioned, expressly conditioned tax credits on state cooperation. Uh, and in fact, many of the folks who signed the congressional amicus brief in support of the government themselves voted in favor of a bill that conditioned credits on state cooperation. Uh, and similar prior health care reform bills, Clinton era reform bills, going all the way back to, to Nixon era, often conditioned money to states on various forms of state cooperation. This is a common thing, and it was done in the context of health care reform here as well. Uh, it avoided the, the charge of a federal takeover. So one of the reasons the, federal, the Senate bill had state exchanges in the first place was because to say this is not a federal takeover, it's not the federal government. Uh, taking over the health insurance market. The Senate Democratic Policy Committee, in fact, issued about the bill saying, why is there no federal takeover? Because every exchange will be run by a state. 
confirms the expectation that folks had that states would cooperate, uh, but tells us nothing about the availability of tax credits and federal exchanges. Last book, the last two quickly, because I haven't told Oh, it is worth remembering that this was a negotiating draft. This was not the bill anyone thought would pass or wanted to pass. It was the Senate bill designed to accommodate Senate concerns. Uh, it was a bill that had to be enacted because there was no alternative. Once Senator Br once Scott Brown was elected to be Senator of Massachusetts, there was no longer a sufficient majority in the Senate to pass a bill that could be reconciled with the House, to pass a bill that might have had a federal exchange completely and avoided these problems. It was this bill or no bill. In fact, uh, that was expressly a, po a point expressly made by many healthcare reform advocates. Here are some quotes from a letter that I believe uh, Professor White signed, urging Congress to pass the Senate bill saying quite clearly that the bill was imperfect, it had problems, and those problems would and should be fixed later, uh, but this bill, despite its problems, should be passed. And I will stop there. Thank you. You're up. Well, thank you very much, Professor Adler. Uh, I'd have to, have to admit that this is, this is a sort of weird panel because uh, we have a couple of lawyers, and this is ultimately a question of, of statutory interpretation, and I'm not an attorney. I can read lots of briefs and so on and see the arguments about them and be very impressed by the way attorneys uh, you know, war with each other by, by citing different parts of Supreme Court precedents. Uh, but my real expertise here is in the actual health care reform process um, and in, leg in how legislation works and on what people would, thought they were doing at the time. I will speak some about that, but I have to speak some about the principles of statutory interpretation because that ultimately is going to be part of, a large part of how the court rules. Um, and it seems to me that uh, perhaps it's wrong, but I'm going to start with the statutory evidence. Um, this is a case about an IRS ruling which authorizes tax credits for people who meet the law's income standards and enroll in a qualified health plan through an exchange set up by the Secretary of HHS. It's well understood if there is plain language, you interpret the statute by plain language. It is also well understood that if the statute is ambiguous with respect to a specific issue being litigated, then the court defers to the agency's construction of the statute so long as it is perm permissible. The question is, is there sufficient ambiguity to believe that the agency, that is the IRS, could permissibly go either way, all right? Uh, Professor Adler is making very clear there's no ambiguity. If it weren't for those people who are biased and want to maintain the Affordable Care Act, this would be a 9 nothing. <laughs> right? That's his position. Uh, and, uh, and, here's, and so here's some of the reasons for ambiguity. As he said, we have Section 1311, uh, which creates, um, uh, which says exchanges <coughs> shall be established by the state. And we also have Section 1321, which creates provisions. It's called State Flexibility Relating to Exchanges. That's the title of, that, of Part 3. It begins by saying the Secretary shall establish standards for operation of exchanges. That's subsection A. Subsection B says states then will elect either to apply the requirements described in that section or not. Subsection C says if a state does not elect to establish an exchange or if the secretary determines that in establishing the exchange the state hasn't met the requirements of the regulations, the secretary shall directly or through agreement with a not-for-profit entity establish and operate such exchange within the state. So such exchange refers back to any required exchange. The required exchange is the exchange required under Section 1311. So one could read this ambiguous as creating a Section 1311 exchange. And the question you have to ask is what else does required under 1311 such mean? Now note, the secretary could create and operate the exchange not only if the state did not elect to set up the exchange, but if the state does not adhere to the regulations promulgated by the secretary. So the secretary might do that to correct what the state has done in establishing an exchange. And it would make no sense to provide for federal fallback to address non-adherence if the result would be exchanges that do not administer key aspects of the law anyway. What's the point? The second argument that gets made for claiming this is ambiguous uh, refers to the definitional section of the, of the law, 
which of course says that the term exchange means an American health benefit exchange established under Section 1311 of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. And this leaves us with two possibilities. Either at all points where the term exchange is used, we are expected to view that as equivalent to the Section 1311 exchanges. Or in Section 1321, when it uses the word exchange, that is not referring to something under 1311, in spite of the definitional section of the law. Now again, this is possible, but it is ambiguous. Um, there's a further ambiguity in the language about the tax credits themselves, and John has talked about section 36B of subpart C of part 4 of subchapter A of chapter 1 to the Eternal Revenue Code of 1986, and he has cited the language in 36B, B, 2A, and in 36B, C, 2A, those little eyes, those little, little, <laughs> Um, but 36BF addresses the problem of implementing the tax credits. Because credits must be applied to the premiums in the year for which you're buying insurance, but they're based on the income in that year, which isn't known at the time you get the credits. So there has to be a reconciliation. And in 36BF3, as amended in the Healthcare and Education Act, which is passed after the PPACA, it says that each exchange or any person carrying out one or more responsibilities of an exchange under Section 1311F3 or 1321C of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act shall provide information to both the taxpayer and secretary about both the premiums charged to the individual for coverage and the tax credit and the aggregate amount of any advance payment of such credit. Now, a regular person would read this and think that there's a possibility that if you're a 1321C uh, uh, exchange, you might possibly be uh, providing tax credits people. John's argument is that no, they will just report that, uh, that they didn't provide any tax credits because they are 1321C and they're not allowed to, raising the interesting issue of why the IRS can't and the individual can't like look at a map and say, okay, you're in Ohio, you don't qualify, right? Um, this seems sort of uh, unnecessary. Um, so I have to ask why you would bother with a report of something that doesn't exist and couldn't possibly under his interpretation exist. Again, another possible interpretation is that Congress thought 1321C exchanges, federal exchanges, were going to be administering tax credits. And it's a particularly compelling interpretation because this is in the Reconciliation Act, which means A, it's subsequent law to the PPACA, and secondly, it pretty much shows what Congress thought it had done in the PPACA, right? We thought we had done this, which is why we're providing these new, these, these, this information requirement. Uh, he has also talked about the, uh, the Medicaid provisions. And the interesting thing about the Medicaid provisions is that they essentially seem to say that if you take the exchange established by the state language seriously, then if there is no exchange established by the state, then the state can't meet the requirements and it therefore can no longer receive Medicaid funding. Now, the position John seems to have just taken is, well, that's so obviously constitutional, they could, unconstitutional, they couldn't have meant that and said that. Although he obviously believes that they do obviously unconstitutional things all the time, as, is, as in his, the other cases he has led against the uh, Affordable Care Act, uh, which he thought they had done and meant to do. Um, my position on this is it shows more ambiguity about what the exchange established by the state language means. Uh, looking at the text, you have two choices, it seems to me. You can interpret the times they say exchange established by the state as very clearly meant for that specific usage in that point, in which case, by the way, no Medicaid in Ohio anymore. Um, or you can interpret it as being essentially a term of art that they got sloppy with. And I will admit they could argue we've gotten sloppy here. Now, you know, that. It would be nice if they, every time they referred to exchanges, said an exchange established by the state or under Section 1321. But there's reasons why you could read this and think that they actually thought that an exchange established by 1321 was actually an exchange established by 1311 or, 13, uh, or, or an exchange established by the state, whatever language you want to use. Now, that's the text. <laughs> 
one could actually look at legislative history. John's way of looking at legislative history is, you, you've heard, um, but there's, let us say, other evidence. Um, one evidence is you can look at the reports. He talks about the, the, uh, the previous stages of the bill. So you can look at the report on the, uh, what was it called? The uh, America's Health, Healthy Future Act of 2009, which was the basic Senate bill, in which, uh, in referring to the language, which included exchanges established by the state, uh, and, and 1321, they say uh, um, at that point, if, if, this, if the state had not established the exchanges within two years of enactment, this is the report language, the secretary would be required to contract with a non-governmental entity to establish the exchanges within the state. And it later refers to, uh, for interim exchanges, the secretary would be required to contract with a non-governmental entity to establish state exchanges. It is very clear that the report did not contemplate the distinction that Professor Adler says the legislation was making. You have to understand what reports do. They try to explain to members of the legislature what they're voting on. If you actually read a bill, it gets very, very hard because it's you know, phrased as things like um, you know, amendments to the Public Health Act and amendments to the uh, Internal Revenue Code and change this word and that word and so on. So Congress, in large measure, relies on report language to figure out what they're uh, voting on. And there are people who say you shouldn't do this, okay? But it's almost impossible for an agency not to do this. And it is, uh, and it's the agency that has to make the determination here in the first instance, of course. And it is not a very, and it is almost impossible for legislators not to do this. Uh, and we could get into a long debate about whether it's plausible. I tend to favor the position of uh, Chief Judge Katzman of the Second Circuit, who uh, knows a great deal about bo both legislation and, and, and statutory interpretation, just wrote a book about it. And his position is that for the reason I've given, uh, uh, you know, that, that it's much clearer Legislators tend to rely on report language, and report language is a pretty good indicator of statutory intent. Um, you can also look at the report language, you know, at the uh, bill to which Professor Adler refers, which is, which is the HELP bill. And if you look at the HELP bill, what you will find is that there was two stages. There was a stage in which uh, a a, uh, the state had not established the exchanges yet. And yes, when the state had not ex established the exchanges yet, then uh, subsidies were not available. But after four years, if the state had not established the exchanges, the federal government would establish the exchanges. And it explicitly said that after the federal government establishes the exchanges, the subsidies are available. That's what it said. The issue here is whether, is whether the legislative history supports the position that when the federal government establishes the exchanges, the, the subsidies are not available. And the legislative history and text of the HELP bill does not support Professor Adler's position. It explicitly says the tax credits are available in the federal exchange. Um, moreover, um, one, of the, one of the arguments that gets, gets made about this is, well, how did other people interpret this at the time? Well, the fact is that, indeed, very few people said, if any, Section 1321 says tax credits will be available. Essentially, everybody said tax credits will be available in all states. Uh, once the federal exchanges have been set up all with the presumption that the federal exchanges are set up. The National Association of Insurance Commissioners made no distinction between the two types of exchanges. The uh, Congressional Research Service made no distinction. The Congressional Budget Office made no distinction. I could cite example after example after example of everybody at the time making no distinction. Now, Professor Adler's position is they made no distinction because they were so convinced that all the states would set up exchanges. 
Now that raises an obvious question. If they were so convinced, why was there federal backup? What was it for? There was, in fact, lots of evidence that some states might not set up exchanges at the time the legislation was passed. For example, the American Legislative Exchange Council was campaigning against, uh, against uh, states setting up exchanges. There was a great deal of reason to believe, among other things, that maybe some states would screw up and not meet the requirements, right? In which case, you might need, you know, the federal government might need to set up the exchanges. The claim that nobody, that everybody anticipated all the states would set up the exchanges is not credible. There was lots of reason, including the fact that the federal fallback is created, to think that, the, that, that somebody was worried about whether the states would set up the exchanges and set up complying ex, you know, in, com, exchanges that were in compliance. So the bottom line here is the court has a choice. Um, they could take a very narrow reading of the language that if they are consistent about it, requires among other things that the Medicaid program go away in 30 something states. Um, or they could follow the general principle of deference under the, under the Chevron case and say, you know, there's some ambiguity here and the balance of all the evidence outside of the text is very clear and therefore we should defer to the IRS which made a permissible determination. With the uh, fine presentations by Professor Adler and White, I kind of feel what Justice Kennedy might must feel like multiple times in the Supreme Court. <laughs> Powerful. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I was in the middle, but the roles were reversed. The left should have been on my left and Professor Adler on my right. Let me give you some prepared remarks and then I'll uh, offer you some personal observations. Despite my respect for Professor Aller as a distinguished member of our law faculty and of my law school alma mater here and his incredible scholarship, no one should be able to balance a legal academic or intellectual gotcha moment on the backs of millions of Americans that stand to lose their health care if subsidies are eliminated. And as you probably all know that if subsidies are eliminated, there's a domino effect because then the employer and individual mandates fall and the core and guts of Obamacare go, can go away. The position of the challengers is particularly troubling knowing as reported by Jeff Tubin of CNN uh, in the uh, recent New Yorker article that he published, the King case was financed by the Competitive Enterprise Institute, whose backers are, among others, the Koch brothers, which has as a mission to eliminate Obamacare. As one of CEI's board members, Mike Greaves, stated uh, publicly, quote, this bastard has to be killed as a matter of political hygiene. I do not care how this is done, whether it's dismembered, whether we drive a state through its heart, whether we tar and feather it, and drive it out of town whether we strangle it. Health care is too precious to each one of us and everyone here is, your health care is just as important to you as it is to me, as to Professor Aller, as to his, Professor White, and every American in this country. And as I've written in my columns, which is part of the handouts um, uh, that you were all provided, health care is too much of a right, not in a constitutional sense, but a moral imperative, to then allow what I call intellectual creatism to have as its sacrificial lamb citizens that the Affordable Care Act is indeed assisting and it's been proven to assist. Why is Obamacare working? According to the Urban Institute and the Rand Corporation in independent studies, if the challenger, challengers win, tax subsidies would be reduced by $29 billion in 2016. The ranks of the uninsured would swell by 8.2 million Americans. Enrollments in the federal marketplaces would decline by 9.6 million Americans. Because healthy, low-cost individuals would disproportionately leave the marketplace, 
Insurance premiums for those remaining would increase by an average of 35%, perhaps as high as 47%. This would correspond to a little over a $1,600 increase for a 40-year-old non-smoker in a silver plan. Now, the challengers, as posited before the U.S. Supreme Court, would say, uh, and I believe Justice Alito picked up on this, well, if we decide for the challengers, we could stay the force and effect of our decision and let the states take care of it. That is, enact uh, their own exchanges, and that would be 34 states. Or, alternatively, let's let the Congress just tweak the language um, established by the state, as Professor Adler has eloquently uh, argued. But uh, Solicitor General Verley said to the, to the court on March 4th, this Congress? Uh, and if you think that 34 states, with, if the challenge were, were to win, were to uh, auto, uh, automatically create uh, their own state-run exchanges, I think uh, any Las Vegas uh, bookie would not take that, that bet. So um, the alternative is to uh, leave the act as it is. And let me uh, close my prepared remarks with uh, giving you two levels of frivolousness and ridiculousness in the challenger's theory. As already mentioned, within the act, there is a provision that states if a state <clears throat> refuses to open an exchange, the federal government will, quote, establish and operate such exchange within the state. You've already heard arguments on, that, on those English words, um, but it's there. That does create ambiguity. And in a recent article in the University of Miami's Business Law Review, there was noted no less than 50 provisions that would be made anomalous, if not absurd, with a reading advanced by the challengers. One example is that only, quote, qualified individuals, close quote, may purchase on an exchange. But that would mean a federal law intended for every American that qualified to allow citizens in only 16 states who have set up their exchanges to have insurance. Now, that clearly was not the intent uh, of Congress when it passed this bill. And, and a, as a third point is that we are all in Ohio. I, I flew in from Chicago. But I'm no different being a resident of Illinois than you all are in Ohio or wherever you hail from originally before coming to law school or that live in Ohio. Uh, the human being is the same in every single state in America. So in the end, this appeal is absurd. That is my uh, uh, opinion. Uh, I know. Um, uh, Professor Eller has written just to the contrary in published uh, remarks. And this supposed, supposed what I call gotcha moment, posited by the challenges, should fall flat on its face. Now let me a uh, add a couple of personal observations. And that is that throughout the discussion, and as the Supreme Court will have to decide, they can't do it on a motion. But what I have addressed in a pragmatic way, since I tend to be pragmatic, um, may be a motivating factor for a fifth or maybe even a sixth justice to side with um, the four, li four liberal uh, members of the court. Um, but what I'm hearing in our discussion so far uh, in terms of subsidies, if you set up an exchange, is this notion of coercion. Now, Justice Kennedy and Justice Sotomayor in the, in their, uh, in the oral arguments both address that. Now, it would not be surprising for Justice Kennedy to address it, because he has in the past, but Justice Sotomayor, early in the oral argument, addressed that, this coercion um, issue. And that begs the question of the doctrine, the federalism doctrine. That is, the federal government should not coerce the states into doing something. Now, obviously, I don't think that they really wanted to emphasize that, because there are other federal law um, where you might arguably say that the federal government coerced the states into doing something like Medicare, for example. But I think that's an important concept and a, and a doctrine really that can, a legal doctrine that can sway at least one member of the conservative bloc to side with the four liberal members in leaving the Affordable Care Act alone. Again, 
you know, I, I, besides being a, a pragmatist, I tend to be, try to get to the simple underpinnings, because generally that rules the day, is that we've heard some extingu uh, distinguished <laughs> arguments, pro and That's con. Extinguished. Not extinguished. <laughs> <laughs> pro, and, yeah, pro and con from Professors White and Professor Adler. Um, but at the end of the day, the Affordable Care Act intended to provide the ability to access and afford health care, and in our country it's through, through health care insurance, uh, but to afford health care for every American, particularly those who cannot afford it. And indeed the results, even with this uh, rollout as we all saw, um, it is proving successful because people are getting insurance through exchanges and those that cannot afford it uh, and who qualify due to their income level are being, a, are being subsidized uh, with the, the subsidies. So that is really the thrust and the, the, and the motivation behind what Congress attempted to do. I happen to believe that there's ambiguity. And as Professor White indicated where there's ambiguity, you, can, you, you rely on the Chevron Doctrine after a U.S. Supreme Court decision that says we'll defer to the agency that's interpreting it. The IRS provided an interpretation, and that's where it should be. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. We will all be extinguished sometime, but, but fast too if we don't have health insurance in some cases. My question is if uh, the Supreme Court uh, decides uh, on the challenger's point of view, what do you think the um, policy implications of the public reaction will be and the legislative reaction? Depends what Congress and states do. Uh, and in terms of the argument of, well, Congress won't do anything, Congress has already enacted a dozen changes that have been signed into law to the Affordable Care Act. And just last night, Congress passed a permanent fix to the so-called, uh, to this, the growth rate for Medicare payments, something that Congress has been unable to do <coughs> permanently for 20 years, yet the supposedly dysfunctional Congress uh, just passed that last night uh, by an overwhelming vote, just as when the VA scandal hit, uh, Congress acted quickly that if there is public demand to fix the law, to make the law operate the way some folks had hoped, as opposed to what they actually enacted, Congress is capable of doing that. And it's hard to evaluate what the political fallout will be until we know what Congress does, until we know what states do, uh, and until we know more realistically what, what the actual effects of, of uh, denial of tax credits and federal exchanges is, because we do know, for example, in a lot of those states, a significant portion of people who have tax credits uh, through federal exchanges are individuals that had non-compliant health insurance plans that were canceled as a consequence of the Affordable Care Act and plans that they could afford and plans uh, that they were told they would be able to keep, but we knew that what we now know that wasn't true. Um, and those people would be able to purchase if they were able to purchase the type of insurance they had before. And so you know, Congress could make that sort of change. States might be able to make that sort of change. Without knowing what those reactions are, it's hard to say what, what the reaction is. I, I particularly like the way Professor Adler s slipped in some inaccurate claims about the effect of the act there. <laughs> um, uh, in, fa in fact, uh, there, there was a small set of people who's probably lost their insurance supposedly liked due to the act. But Several the million, according to the White House. No, the research that has been done shows uh, the vast majority of the cancellations were cancellations that would likely have occurred anyway because there was a great deal of churning in the individual market and changing of policies uh, before the Affordable Care Act was passed. Um, having said that, uh, you have to remember that the Affordable Care Act created market regulations as well, and these market regulations uh, would make it difficult, Professor Adler is referring to this, to recreate the forms of insurance that existed before, because they were really quite crappy, actually. Um, 
And because of that, uh, you would probably, if you just went, if you just got rid of the subsidies, the individual insurance market would probably uh, be even more broken, basically in a death spiral, because you would have the the market regulations without the, the subsidies, mm -hmm. and therefore you would have a, an even worse individual insurance market than we had before. This is part of the whole argument which we didn't get into about uh, the overall structure of the act being such that without the subsidies, the rest of the act makes no sense. And this is an argument made by, and would have negative effects, and this is an argument made by many of the people arguing uh, you know, against the uh, the plaintiffs here uh, arguing in defense of the act, uh, but we didn't get into that, into that. The consequence, therefore, you would need to have some sort of, and by the way, any legislation to fix that, right, to fix the market regulations without fixing the subsidies uh, uh, issue would probably run into a hostage game where the liberal side would be saying, no, we're not gonna fix the market regulations unless you fix the subsidies, okay? So, uh, so I think it is very, very hard to predict. I think in the short run, it is that there would be chaos and pain. How long that would last, I don't know. Oh, I'll, I'll just uh, add, when we have a house that has repeal, or attempted to repeal uh, Obamacare 56 times, 57 times, um, and knowing the dire consequences, the uh, the chess pieces falling in order, if the challenge were, were to win, we would have a huge political mess, and I don't think the states are gonna start creating their own exchanges. Um, my question is about the general authority of the IRS to grant tax abatements. Um, even apart from Obamacare, you know, we have a Supreme Court decision that said Obamacare is a tax. Uh, aren't these subsidies just a tax abatement like any other? No, they're, they're, they're refundable <coughs> tax credits, and the CBO analysis estimates that about 80% of the incidence of these tax credits take the form of out direct outlays from the federal treasury, so it's actually spending. And it's a long-standing. There's a long-standing uh, principle applied to tax statutes and to spending statutes that you don't lightly assume that money was meant to be authorized unless Congress expressly did so. And at oral argument, um, when the issue came up about whether or not the IRS should be given deference under the Chevron doctrine, as has been mentioned, Justice Kennedy, who most people assume is the swing vote in this case, said that it would be a drastic step. Drastic was his word. Uh, to assume that all authority to decide whether or not there are tax credits uh, in federal exchanges rests with because a consequence of assuming that the statute is ambiguous and that therefore the court must defer to the IRS means that it, it is a discretionary policy choice of the IRS that can be reversed at any time. And the idea that the billions of dollars at issue could be turned on or off as at, at, at IRS's whim, again, in Justice Kennedy's words, would be a drastic step, and then Chief Justice Roberts asked a follow-up question to, to underline that point, that it was something be something the IRS could turn on and off, and that would be quite remarkable. And, and, but to get back to the core of your question, the IRS generally um, is subject to the same rules of administrative law as other, state, other agencies, although there's a lot of scholarship suggesting that it uh, does not do a very good job following those requirements, and, and the explanation it gave for the regulation in this case, I think, is a good example of this. Whatever you think of the substance of the regulation, the IRS did not do what, for example, the FCC or the EPA or other federal agencies do as a matter of course when adopting a potentially controversial statutory interpretation. Uh, I would just like to point out a few things here. One is I haven't the faintest idea how the justices are going to rule and how they're going to make this judgment. Um, uh, this is not a matter of an agency creating a tax abatement. It's a matter of an agency creating a law. It could not go out, you know, if the law were not passed, the agency could not have gone out and said, oh, we're going to give people tax credits. Right. Uh, one can argue that the whole idea that this is tax credits rather than spending is a little weird and is a matter of the bizarre politics of federal spending and of how uh, it really goes back to the 1990s when Republicans didn't want to spend, but they liked tax cuts. And so it was a Republican idea to do subsidies as tax credits. And the Democrats like that because they don't want to be ex accused of spending either. And so there's a whole politics of the way this is done that ends up 
being tax credits for no good substantive reason. Because they're not only tax credits, they're refundable tax credits, and they're refundable tax credits in advance, and as Professor Adler says, most of the people, a lot of the people who get them wouldn't have paid taxes in the first place, wouldn't have paid income tax in the first place, and so you, it's, it's, it's a really bizarre way of having a spending program. But that's the decision Congress made. And uh, there are all sorts of things that are rulings by the IRS, and to the extent that they're rulings by the, uh, the IRS, I suppose in principle the IRS could reverse itself. Uh, you have a whole lot of people with stakes in them. That doesn't happen very often. I think that during oral argument, and maybe John could correct me, but, uh, but uh, Kennedy, I believe, was concerned that about leaving in an agency billions of dollars and therefore wh why the court should defer to that agency, which ma makes one who's reading the tea leaves think, well, maybe that's not going to be, the, the Chevron uh, interpretation is not going to be the one that rules the day. Maybe there will be another doctrine that will influence Kennedy more than leaving it to the agency to interpret uh, how, it, how it interpreted uh, the subsidy. So I'll only add to that that the agency has to interpret Right? If the agency is you know, presented with ambiguity, and you know, I, I'm sorry, I don't know what the norm is for how many darn sources an agency cites more uh, than for zero. its argument, but, I, but, I, but, but if, they want, if they wanted to support, to cite more sources, they could have cited a great well, many. Just to give an example, tomorrow one of our alums uh, is arguing a case before the D.C. Circuit, an environmental protection agency regulation that involves a similarly interesting statutory interpretation question. The EPA produced a legal memorandum of over 100 pages purely on the statutory interpretation question. Here the IRS produced a paragraph that does not cite a single source. And, it's, and on top of that, it's one thing to interpret. It's one thing to say the word exchange means this or that. Um, in addition to defining exchange, the statute also says that definition is only a default definition and only applies unless the statute otherwise specifies. It's something completely different to pretend as if words in the statute have no meaning whatsoever and serve no purpose. And, and, that's, and that's the problem that, that, that the IRS has, and it's a problem that came up in oral argument. And, that, and Justice Kennedy, who raised federalism concerns, also with the Solicitor General, a bunch of times said, if, you meant, if it meant established in the state, why didn't they say that? If it meant established by the federal government, why didn't it say established by the federal government? Why didn't they just leave it out? And in fact, what we know is just not leave it out. It added additional references to established by the state in the relevant provisions during the drafting process. In Senator Reid's office, right before the bill went to the floor, they added an additional reference to established by the state in section 1401. No one who was in the can say why. And the federal government doesn't have any reason why, but they're asking the, federal what the, the court to do is to pretend as if those words aren't. That's a drastic thing to do, whatever one thinks of the policy implications. Except there's ambiguity. I will agree that there's ambiguity. I don't think anybody would say that statute of 900 pages or 2,000, however long it was when it was printed, is entirely crystal clear. There's ambiguity, and if there's ambiguity, then fill in the blank. But there well, has I, to be a blank to fill in, well, and that's I, 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 ambiguity on the precise question at issue. And the precise well, question at issue is where are credits available? Where they're available in exchanges. Why do we know? 1401 says so. They're available to people with 100 to 400 percent of the poverty line. How do we know? Section 1401 says so. It has to be an exchange established by the state. A phrase that I, I guarantee you every member of Congress, had they read the statute, would know precisely what established by the state means, especially since state is defined in the statute. This isn't an obscure cross-reference like in the Medicaid provisions where you've got to be sitting there going back and forth. Established by the state is plain language, and on top of that, we get definitions. And I have to insist that um, if every member of the Congress would have understood this, it's really remarkable that absolutely nobody understood it. And, and the idea that this is meant to be <laughs> coercive, that there was an intention that this coerced the state, is an uh, is an argument that is made up of whole cloth. When they want to coerce the state, they're very good at it. In the HELP bill, when they want to condition on the state, they condition on the state until there's a federal exchange. And the state in, what imposes the here, employer mandate. You forgot so, that part, too. What? Okay, the state also has to impose can the employer I mandate. Can insert myself here? We no, have you're so misunderstood. many questions. I don't want to get right. hung up on this one question. We have so many. I'm sure. I'll, I'll, I'll go, go ahead. <laughs> Perhaps this will... 
this will confuse things more. Uh, my question is for Professor White, and admittedly, criticizing statutory interpretation inside a school of law makes you a witch in church, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, what I would like to ask you, sir, is if there is indeed ambiguity, if you could clarify some of the ambiguity in your statements, not credible, proving successful, very clear, regular person, almost impossible, quite crappy, and if you could define some of those terms as they relate to the intellectual got you moment by the challengers. And furthermore, if you could speak on the credibility of legislative history, if you've looked back to cases like Continental Can, where Senator Durenberger goes back and manipulates the legis history post hoc after it's been uh, passed into law by the people that we elect. If you could please explain how statutation is supposed to fall by the wayside when it's what our elected officials vote on in the first place. An excellent question. <laughs> it's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say, for the first part of the question, I would need to see the, the, I would need to go back to what I said and have the context in order to answer it easily. I think in this particular, uh, in the case of the use of legislative history, okay, there is no doubt that there are times when legislators try to manipulate parts of the legislative history in ways that are perhaps not understood by other members of the legislature, right? This is part of the strategy of trying to pass legislation. There is also that legislators, when they are trying to figure out what legislation is, do not simply look at the text of the bill. The reason you have reports is so committees explain to their colleagues what the bill is about and what it is meant to do. Because unless you actually have the entire US code in front of you, it can be very difficult to figure out what, a, what the actual text of a bill does. That is why uh, both agencies and members of the legislature, when voting, frequently look to sources such as the, the reports from the committees, uh, hearing information, and so on. Uh, yes, legislative history can be flawed and manipulated. By the way, laws can also be intentionally ambiguous. By the way, people could vote for things for all sorts of reasons. Um, but uh, there is, if you understand, and again, I really commend to you uh, Judge Katzman's book because you know this is this is the product of of, of a judge who has spent a lot of time working with legislators, <laughs> through the judicial conference and so on. If you understand how legislation works, the the idea that the only way to, that that legislation can or should be understood only by looking at the text doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Now, you can choose to take as your principle of judicial interpretation that you will only look at the text. And if you look at, for example, uh, Justice Scalia's um, arguments of this sort, they are very clearly based on a great deal of distrust of the legislature. Um, and uh, and the, from what I read, the various forms of quote unquote textualism have evolved over time to try to be less obviously hostile to the legislature. But it is generally uh, a position based on distrust. Um, it may be a justified distrust in some ways, but, it's not a, but uh, it tends to raise as many problems as it solves. So there's not, again, this is, the, the difficulties of statutory interpretation can definitely be great. In this particular case, it seems to me there is no doubt of two propositions. One is that the people who drafted this law were not trying to do what Professor Adler says, which is to draft the law in a way that would coerce the states to set up the exchanges. They were not trying to do that. None of them were aware they were trying to do that. There was no reason for them to be trying to do that. At the same time, there was no doubt that the law could have been drafted more carefully 
for their purposes. And the rulings that the court will make, the decisions that the individual justices will make, will depend on where they want to come out, uh, and will depend in part on, I guess, some notion of the extent to which uh, in this supposed argument between intentionalism or textualism, um, they should stick to the text rather than the intent. I don't know what else is going to come out. In the end, in the end uh, and we've got to wrap up, I'm, no. Do you want to take the ability of millions of Americans to get health care, to ma maintain, acquire, or reacquire their health, do you want to take that away from them? That's the bottom line. That's the thrust uh, of all of this. And that's where I come down. I'm going to give time for two more questions. Those who want to hang around, the gentleman uh, with the microphone. Question for Professor Adler. If, um, if you should lose this appeal, uh, do you, is there a, can you point to another provision in the uh, act that would provide the basis for another constitutional challenge? And when you were considering what uh, uh, this initial challenge, did you look at a alternative or plan B for uh, attacking the bill? When I, when I began the research that led to this, uh, the can idea- Can I ask everybody to leave quietly, please, while questions are still being there was It was not at all clear that it would ever result in litigation. In fact, when I first wrote about this, it was not clear to me that anyone would have standing to sue. It was initially, look, the IRS, like agencies often do, like the IRS often does, was issuing a regulation uh, contrary to the text of a statute. Um, my co-author and others eventually realized it could be turned into litigation. Um, it's the, no, this is not a constitutional challenge. It's a challenge to the statute. Um, there are plenty of other statutory challenges pending in federal court right now. Maine has one that, with a cert petition pending challenging the interpretation of the maintenance of eligibility requirements. State of Ohio has one that the Attorney General filed on um, fees imposed on state and local government insurance plans to fund reinsurance. Uh, there will be others. Um, I, have, I have a paper out that basically says this is this this statute creates a perfect storm for endless litigation in terms of its implementation. Uh, I have other things I personally would prefer to be working on, um, and 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 I'd like to say that I, that I get to turn after, after July uh, for a while. But there will be more litigation. There already is more litigation. Um, it is a statute that, for a variety of reasons, will produce litigation for decades and decades. We have one more question. Thank you. Uh, uh, beyond the uh, legalism of esotericism, I'm a senior case management. It, it appears to be that there's a pecuniary interest, even with all the uh, uh, blowback or whatever, and, and the esoteric sophistry and analysis of legalism uh, in terms of these private insurance, Qualcare, United Healthcare. <coughs> somebody get somebody is making a, a, a serious profit. They say this is a a burden upon the taxpayers, this, that, and the other. And what I see amongst my client base, they all got cars and whatnot, so all these private insurance carriers, somebody making some money. CEOs, vice presidents, whatever. And that's they bad. Me that. and, in, and all terms the of, yeah. in terms of administering the Affordable Care Act that is outsourced through private insurers. Yeah, I, excuse me, but, but uh, and, and I guess I'm wondering what exactly is wrong with that. Um, well, uh, look, I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a great fan of the private insurance industry, but the issue here is whether people will be deprived of the, of the opportunity to buy private insurance. And if your position is that you want to reduce profits and income to private insurers, then you should side with Professor Adler in this litigation. <laughs> Yes. All, all the insurers that filed briefs in this case, in fact, all of the private corporations and trade associations that filed briefs in this case, filed them on behalf of the federal government. Thank you all for staying. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for putting these on for a while. So, I think this is for you. No, it's not. Our goodie bag. I probably have. Oh, goodie. What do I have? Just a moment.